I'm going to present and I'm going to show you what stippling is. So let me present to you my screen and let's take a look at stippling. So uh, this is a very basic example of stippling. It's a sphere and it's, um, it's stippling is best done with a really fine ink pen. Okay, so here you have your sphere and it looks, you know, it, it's a little rough, but it's still really effective. You got a shadow under it. Um, you got a little white area right here that's called reflected light. Um, there is no lines at all. They didn't draw with anything but the dots. There is a highlight over here on this side, opposite side to the shadow, of course. So if you are R2, you already did this last year, you already shaded a sphere. They have some mid-tones here and lighter mid-tones and darker mid-tones, so those are all there. Very good. You can see the seashell. That's all done with stippling too. And look at this fist. You got the watch band and nowhere on here is there a line. It's just dots. So if you look, even the, I can make out a thumbnail here and that's all made up of dots that are closer or further together. The dots are closer together, together in the areas of shadow. And how do you make metal look like metal? You know, like if you ever wanted to draw something metallic, metal, it has reflections in it. So they put like these, these big contrasting reflections, like a dark area right next to a light area. That is one of the ways you're supposed to shade metal to make it look like metal. So there's a lot of contrast, darks and lights right next to each other. For something like skin, which is not as shiny, you know, the, there's not as much contrast and the shading is more mm, gradual, okay? Um, here is a rose and I try to see if I can catch the person using a line and I really couldn't really find that because if I look real close I could still see the little dots along the, the edges where I feel like there might be a line. So these roses are all done with stippling. You know, that's very, very good. Here you can see all the little dots that make up that line so it's not like a true line. Um, and usually stippling is done to express something really smooth. It's really great when you are trying to use an ink pen to shade a face or shade skin. This is really a gorgeous example of stippling. So look at the lips. Look at the lips. They're not flat. They're not like two planes cut out of the face. There's this little area that bulges out here. That's all done with little really fine dots. Look at the nose. You see this little light here underneath the nose, kind of on the edge of the nostrils? That's reflected light. So the person did not put, uh, or hardly put any dots in those areas. They avoided putting dots in those areas. And inside the nostrils, of course, the holes of the nose, they concentrated the dots and inside the, the mouth opening. Um, here's an eye. Yes, they kind of, did not use dots for the eyebrows, but ignore the dot. <laughs> ignore the eyebrows. Look at the eye. Some of this, you know, uh, shading around the eye. When you look at stippling, you're supposed to look at it from a distance, like this. This is really, really fine stippling. Look at the teardrop and the shadow under the teardrop. Um, it's all stippled. Right here, this raccoon. I'm picking this example out because the person actually tried to express non-smooth texture with stippling. They actually stippled a lot of the little individual hairs on this raccoon's fur. They tried to express this wood grain. It's not bark. I think it's just wood, like underneath the bark. And, um, and even the way that they left areas white that are up against the dark background so that these whiskers would show. And then the whiskers are, of course, in a dark gray, even if it's a few dots, against the light. So it's like the opposite going on with the whiskers against the dark background and against the light background. The eyes look kind of hard and shiny. So lots of texture, right? Can you use t stippling to make non-smooth things? Yes, look at this elephant skin. Amazing texture with stippling. 
I think this lady looks like Maya Angelou. If you look at here, this was all done with this Micron pen, and that's a really, really um, thin uh, kind of uh, ink pen. And it even comes like at a size zero, 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 I think. I might have seen one of those, which is a super thin dot. So that person created this drawing or started creating this drawing and she's just now shading or he's shading uh, this lady's face with just dots. And you can see the reflected light on this side bouncing off of her white blouse onto the dark side of her face. Yes, you can have light on the dark side of an object or a person's face and it just makes it look a lot more three-dimensional uh, than having it just be flat black. That would not be not be realistic okay so that's stippling for the art twos and i want the art ones to look at this too i want to you know tell you a little bit about pointillism so pointillism was invented by this gentleman um georges seurat that i was talking about but there was also um he there was another artist as well who knew him paul signac and they developed this technique together um they came uh, they were working at, with pointillism after the Impressionists. So who are the Impressionists? Like, what if you don't know what Impressionism is? So Impressionism was a art movement. It was mostly painters, oil painters, who painted with these little flicks, little strokes of paintbrush color to create their painting. So this is a great example of impressionism here this is called claude monet's haystacks claude monet monet is the artist and these are the haystacks at sunset what is amazing that you need to know about the impressionists is that um, monet did several paintings of this same haystack at different times of the day so the Impressionists tried to capture the impression of a subject at a specific time of day by studying and painting the quality of light. So you, through the use of the, the depiction of light, they tried to capture time. They tried to capture time. So Monet also did a series of paintings of the front of cathedral, the front of that very large cathedral or church. And he painted it multiple times at different hours of the day. So he would go and switch up his canvas uh, and do one at 10 o'clock in the morning and do another one at two o'clock in the afternoon to try to capture the quality of light and to express and capture time. That's what I'm trying to say. Incredible and remarkable that these people were trying to do that through their art. So I want you to kind of try to grapple with that concept. It's a very interesting concept that the Impressionists were doing. But getting back to pointillism, so George Seurat's work was developed and was was influenced by the Impressionists. So he took it to the next step and he used little dots of color. So he created something called divisionism, which is when you use uh, white, black, or one of the pure colors, red, blue, and yellow. And he would mix a combination of those colors to create all the other colors and it was very very strict you were not allowed to paint uh in mix you were not allowed to mix like the other colors like orange or purple or those in between colors you were only limited to the pure colors the primary colors in white and black so that's called divisionism the second technique was a lot more relaxed. So that's what you're doing right now. Pointillism included mixing different colors. So you were allowed to mix a pink. You were allowed to mix an orange or green or whatever, but you were still putting dots of colored colors next to each other um, so that from a distance, they would mix together in your eye 
in your viewpoint and create another color. And all these art movements kind of are related to each other. One art movement leads to another art movement that leads to yet another discovery and another type of art movement. So then Georges Seurat's technique led to using bigger cube shaped brush strokes of color right next to each other. And that eventually became what's known as cubism. So we're gonna take a look at a couple of uh, people who used or were influenced by these artists. Here's Vincent van Gogh. And in some of his earlier works, you really see these little smaller brush strokes that almost look like dots. And this is a portrait of himself. So this is called a self-portrait of Vincent van Gogh. Yes, he is that famous painter who cut his own ear off. So many, 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 many theories of why he did it. Uh, mental illness, depression, which is mental illness. Um, you know, he was upset. Um, he was poisoned by his own art supplies because it was lead in the paint, very dangerous, and it drove him mad. Lots of different theories of why he did that to himself. Uh, he eventually did shoot himself and he died. So he had a lot of emotional, personal issues, very struggling artist, very poor always helped by his brother so he always had great great feelings of turmoil great feelings of guilt of being always supported by his family member and in the end um you know it, it ended very tragically and he was very poor and unrecognized until several decades later and now he, you know he is world famous his paintings are worth millions and millions of dollars very typical of what happens to great painters. Okay, so here's a very famous piece by Georges Seurat, who did not suffer as bad as fate as poor Vincent van Gogh. This is called The Bathers at Asnier, and he was French, so of course you're going to see some French words. And Asnier is, uh, I guess, the town or the area. This one is the most famous. So if you need to know one painting, at least one painting done by Georges Seurat, it is a Sunday afternoon on the island of Grand Jatte. Grand, La Grand Jatte means the big, right? So La Grand Jatte. And it is just a beautiful scene of a Sunday afternoon of people enjoying themselves at the park. The ladies have parasols to keep the sun off of their faces. They got hats on. Everybody is dressed in, you know, some very nice clothes. And it's just a lovely scene. You can see, just really see the beautiful quality of the sunlight on the grass. Here, the this group in the front, in the foreground, is in shadow. Maybe there's a large um, the grove of trees behind them, casting a shadow. I don't know, because it's off the sea. I want you to think of something here. This canvas is 10 feet wide at its longest length. 10 feet wide, okay? And the whole thing is painted with little dots, little dabs of paint from a paintbrush. So you can only imagine how long this piece took. And uh, Surat did several, several canvases that were very large like this. So here is a, another artist, Theo von Weisselberg. He is not Surat, so there were other artists who were picking up on this technique. Camille Pizarro, very, very famous artist as well. And you can kind of see how what kind of colors he uses to create other colors. Here's another Surat of a lady who is doing her makeup. Just with little dots of color, he created all these other colors. I just love this piece. This one is done with little strokes of colors too. And you can kind of really tell by this little girl's face that she is typical little kid's face. She's very sick and tired of posing for this artist. Okay, 
And then this is where I start to talk about the cubist. So you see how the dots of color start getting bigger and they almost look like big, big square brush strokes, big chunks, they're like little squares. And that leads to a chunkier style of painting called cubism. So now it starts to transform and become something else. Okay, this is more of, uh, you know, this is not cubism. I would say this is a little bit more like post-impressionist pointillism. So, all right. So I just wanted to show you a couple different things here, some examples. And I'm going to go to the exercise now and start you off.